filing in. So, uh, wow, what, what, what a crowd. Um, pretty amazing. You know, it's, it's exciting to, to host you all here. Uh, so I'm Marcus Jettis. I'm uh, Senior Director of Employee Success and Head of Talent Acquisition here at Constant Contact. Welcome. Uh, I'll be brief. Nobody's here to, to, to hear from me. I'm just going to give a, a, a quick uh, overview of the, uh, the agenda here, the boring stuff, the, the logistics. And uh, we'll, we'll and talk about why we're here and we'll get started. So uh, first and foremost, uh, this facility is about 90% done. One of the things that is not completed yet are the bathrooms. So uh, that's no, no worries. So right out your the, the exit here, uh, straight by Boston Sports Clubs, men in, in uh, women's room, as well as, well as straight down here uh, as well. Uh, for you social media fanatics, I know we have plenty. Uh, we do have a Twitter hashtag for the, the event. It's uh, TA Team Sport. You'll, you'll see up there we'll have the uh, tweet beam going uh, as well. So um, anyway, just quick agenda. So food and, and drinks is, uh, to start. We've got an unbelievable panel here tonight uh, of engineering executives in, in the area uh, led by uh, moderator Sheroy Desai from Guild, and, and thank you for, for Guild uh, coming out here from, from San Francisco. Really, uh, just want to say quickly as well, uh, if anyone needs a hand tonight, you need anything at all, members of the talent acquisition team here at Constant Contact, we all have these yellow badges on, please, please reach out. All right, so that, that's it um, on, on that front. So just, just a quick word about, uh, <clears throat> a couple words about the inner loft and why we're here. So first and foremost, amazing response I mentioned. We have over 70 guests here tonight, right? 70 ta predominantly talent acquisition leaders from some of Boston's best technology companies. So pr pretty amazing, okay? And, and again, thanks for, for coming out. <clears throat> uh, a little bit about this facility you're in. So this, welcome to the innovation loft here, Constant Contact. Uh, this facility is now just about a month old. It is the brainchild of our head of innovation, uh, Andy Miller. Andy's in the back, and you give a little wave, Andy. So, uh, you know, this was uh, a big part of Andy's vision and idea. This is him here taking the, the home run swing, and, and we are swinging for the fences. We're swinging for the fences to deliver small business success everywhere. And that's what this building this facility was all about. It's the first of its kind, this 30,000 square foot state-of-the-art facility, first of its kind dedicated to driving small business success. There's not another startup acceler accelerator like it. Uh, we have four programs going on, four startups in here that will rotate through um, <clears throat> every four months. For example, one of them is Mosaic Hub. Mosaic Hub aspires to be the Angie list, Angie's list of small business. Uh, so Mosaic Hub's led by Mary Alice Miller, who recently appeared in Boston Business Journal's uh, Top 40 Under 40 in Mass High Tech's Women to Watch, uh, 20 Women to Watch. So this whole facility, you know, driving small business, business success, um, we've opened this up to the, the small business startup community to interact with our employees, to leverage our tools and technologies, to partner together. This is unlike anything else. We're not taking equity or anything else. It's just about the mission to drive small business success. And the event's used for several things. Uh, employee training and development initiatives, company-wide meetings, outside events like this, as well as other programs. For instance, Andy's leading an initiative right now uh, with uh, um, a uh, entrepreneurial startup program. Five young ladies from Winchester High School who are developing software, building a company called Time Out that will help athletes know if they have concussions or not. So solving real problems. So that's a little bit about the in loft. <clears throat> Let's talk about why we're here. The war for talent. We're all trying to win. Unites us all, doesn't it? It's a real problem. The war for talent's a real problem. And it's going to get worse. You know, you think we have talent shortages now. Estimated 30% of science, technology, engineering, and math students are either dropping out of school or switching majors. Less and less students are entering the STEM field, again, that's science, technology, engineering, math, to begin with. 
And beyond that, we've got immigration issues in the country that make no sense. And now we've got non-compete issues. This is a real problem. Bodes well for recruiter job security. This is the golden age of talent acquisition. Embrace it, all right? Sunny sky, sky's the limit. Or maybe it's the starting point. Case in point, last year US companies spent $72 billion on recruiting and hiring, 72 billion, all right? The talent acquisition industry marketplace is a $5 billion industry. That's internal, external, uh, recruiting software, products, services. All right, $5 billion. Since the financial meltdown in 2008, no other industry has created more jobs than the recruiting industry. It's a fact, look it up. All right, so these are great times. One more story here. So I was recently on campus, uh, Babson College. I know we have a few people from Babson here. And I was a career development event for MBA students. And I had a couple MBA students come up to me and I'm thinking, okay, this is gonna be a marketing or finance conversation. They said, how do I become a recruiter? <laughs> I, I didn't know what to say. I mean, my first reaction was, you don't want to do that. <laughs> but it was the first time I ever really thought about this as a profession, you know? So I, the first time I ever really hit me right in the face, okay, you know, this is just like finance or marketing. So again, embrace these times. Uh, so many ideas and innovations in recruiting, right? I, I feel like it used to be every 10 years something new came out. Now I feel like it's every 10 days. And yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, somebody's gonna do it. You know, who's gonna be the next LinkedIn guild? I don't know, we'll see. Um, but this one fundamental thing that I don't think has ever changed about talent acquisition and driving success in talent acquisition. I don't know if it ever will. Can I have, I know we have a lot of leaders here, can I have a brave recruiter in the audience tell me how many people you, you've hired this year? Ballpark. Okay. Introduce. Anyone? Oh, come on. Someone. Brian? 45. 45 people. That's a lot. Congratulations. I think so. You're going to walk out of here tonight with, with five offers. So, I actually disagree with you. I don't think you've hired anybody. Recruiters don't hire people. Hiring managers hire people. We need them and they need us. That's how it has to work. That's how the, the game is played. So, Brian, I didn't want to call you out without a, a little gift, so you get the goodies tonight for, for speaking up. So this is really what brings us here tonight. And um, you know why we're here. This is what's going to fuel this discussion. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Sheroy Desai, CEO of Guild. Uh, Sheroy has local ties. He's a uh, MIT grad. Started out at Cambridge Technology Partners. Uh, went on as one of the founding members of Sapien, uh, where he became Chief Operating Officer and spent more than a decade there. And is now the the CEO of Guild, who is uh, solving a lot of problems and making a lot of waves for for all of us. So. Uh, enjoy the night. That's it for me, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Can I Can everyone hear me? Or yeah. I need the mic. No? You can, you can hear me? Mike. Mike? Mic? All right. Oh. <laughs> So, um, first of all, I want to um, thank Marcus, uh, his team at Constant Contact for hosting us. Well, it's a great facility, and in fact, I think we're actually getting a preview because uh, I was talking to Ken earlier, and the grand opening actually is this coming Thursday. So, we are quite privileged, yes. Thank you very much for letting us use this. Uh, but also for really arranging this and making this happen. Uh, you know, we are a San Francisco-based startup, and as such, uh, you know, we were really relying on uh, Constant Contact and Marcus and his team to uh, really help us with the logistics, and they've clearly done an outstanding job. Um, also, I want to welcome our panelists, and they will introduce themselves in a little bit, and uh, we're really looking forward to you know, having a conversation uh, what I want to do is kind of in terms of introducing the topic, uh, Marcus did a great job talking about 
uh, you know, the war for talent and what's going on. I just want to add a little bit of, you know, my color to that uh, before we get going. And, you know, so number one, uh, you know, we live, and I talk about we guild, we, we live in the world of uh, engineering uh, recruiting. Uh, we have a soft, I'm not going to talk much about us, we have a software solution that is really a predictive analytics solution that helps identify uh, software engineers around the world. Uh, so we're very, you know, when we interface and talk to our customers, uh, we're having highly in-depth conversations about how are they successful or not successful in finding and hiring and engaging the software engineers and what are the things that work and what are the things that don't work. And, uh, and as you may, I think all of you know, uh, the supply demand inequality in software for software engineers today is just massive. And you know, our viewpoint is that what is going on is we are really seeing uh, today, you know, in the world play out, you know, a prediction Mark and Reeson made a few years ago when he talked about it and wrote his op-ed in the Wall Street Journal that said software is eating the world. And it is happening. Right? I mean uh, you cannot think of a single industry uh, or segment, even the physical, you know, what we normally associate with the physical world uh, is getting gobbled up by tech companies. Uh, Uber is a great example of that, right? I mean, the old taxi industry, I mean, gosh, who imagined that that was actually going to become a tech industry? Uh, and, you know, we're seeing that with uh, places like, you know, the physical hotels and Airbnb. Uh, and many, many examples like that, but this is, you know, we are at the start of this uh, journey and as we go down this, uh, the need and demand for software engineers is only going to go up. The supply side is not changing fast enough. You know, uh, you know, Mark has talked about this, but you're not seeing more CS grads coming out uh, of colleges. That's a problem. Immigration is certainly, uh, immigration policy doesn't help. Uh, so that's, at least we can't see the, you know, any daylight there anytime soon. So I do think we are in this state where all of us are going to be competing for the best talent out there. And it is only going to get heated up. And Ken and I were having a conversation about how companies, you know, including even startups now, are going and looking for talent in all kinds of places. It's not limited to just the Bay Area or you know, the Boston area of New York, but now we're looking at places like Salt Lake City and Las Vegas as you know, trying to reinvent itself as a tech hub of source, et cetera. So we're seeing you know, all kinds of very interesting things going on. But bringing back you know, to why we are here today, you know, one of the things we have, uh, you know, as we enter this arena and as it continues to get more heated up, we also think companies have to change the way they think about how hiring works. And it is no longer, you know, in our viewpoint, simply something that can be handed off to talent acquisition or HR and said it's your problem. Uh, it really is a team challenge and it has to be solved you know, by engaging hiring managers, you know, talent acquisition, I mean honestly even senior executives. Uh, everyone needs to get involved in you know, how hiring does. So we wanted to explore that topic with a couple of our panelists here. And with that I'm going to actually pass the mic around and let them introduce themselves. Uh, I'd love to, you know, maybe obviously please introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your backgrounds, you know, what you do, but also maybe you know, add your own color as to what are the challenges you are facing when it comes to hiring today. Uh, you know, what are the opportunities, what are the challenges, what are the opportunities, and I'm just going to add a little more to this conversation. Certainly. Uh, my name is Christina Langell. I work for Kronos. I've been with Kronos for four years, for uh, three and a half quarter of a year I ran a lot of the engineering side of the organization and now also uh, taking over professional services. Um, in the engineering organization I had about 330 people worldwide in various locations and with uh, professional services it's about 800 and the shift to the cloud actually makes this very blurry because of the skill set requirement is, is getting somewhat blurry. So um, Kronos is in the business of workforce manage management. It's exclusively creating software for work or workforce management in a business for about 37 years. 
We have about 3,600 plus employees, 3,700 employees. And on average, we bring on board in the rolling 12 months for probably, you can count the last six, seven months, about 460, 470 people on a regular basis. So that's significant. That's not just in Chelmsford, obviously. That's not quite a hub. You can attract a lot of talent there. Um, but um, one of the challenge that it, we are facing is that although we have a very stable financial structure, we are very profitable, we have um, great reason for people to join and remain at Kronos. We are not that sexy, right? You know, the perception is still that this is an old time clock company that's been in the business for 30 some odd years. Why do I want to go there? Also, why do I want to commute to Chelmsford of all places, right? There's nothing in Chelmsford. So we had various ways of overcoming. Obviously, you just mentioned one of the things that we did is open a technology center in Indianapolis, of all places, taking advantage of tax relief and local um, agencies that sponsor it, as well as a building relationship with local schools to foster the talent. And, and we have a commitment of number of talent we bring in and train. I can get into it later um, if you wish, but that's one of the things. The other thing is, this is a very different fight for talents that you saw in the dot-com area. It's not enough to know how to spell Java or C++ or C Sharp or any of those technologies. You actually have to have substance. Substance with experience and makes the talent acquisitions very, very interesting. I also have to agree, I have my um, HR talent acquisition business partner here because we are joined at the hip. And I not just tell her what are the technical skill set requirements, I do engage her about strategic planning, where I need to be, where the organization is going, I envision the organization evolving over time because I want her to really start screening individuals not just for its basic skills and knowledge but also the cultural fit, the longitude of the, the, the employment. It's not enough to just uh, attract them. I need to be able to retain them. And uh, unless I share that long-term vision, She's not going to be able to succeed. Uh, hello, my name is Elias Torres. I'm the VP of Engineer at HubSpot, and we are sexy. No, definitely we much smaller company, um, much smaller scale. My focus is really uh, just hiring for the engineering organization. We, we basically, for example, last year we hired about 50 engineers. So we, you know, we grew from 50 to about 100. The whole product organization is about 150 now. And we'll probably hire around the same this year. The rest of the company is growing much faster, but most of my experience is hiring an engineer. I will tell you today all the answers to how to write the best emails, <laughs> where to find people, and how to just get the best talent ever. I have all those answers. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, it's really hard, and basically what I've done is, I, I'm an engineer, I worked, worked at IBM for about 10 years, I worked at, uh, and then I left chasing the startup dream, so this is my third startup uh, after leaving IBM, and HubSpot has really been the first place where I realized how important it was that I let go of my engineering responsibilities and focus on recruiting full time, right? I, I basically, that's what I do, you know, my recruiters and I, we have two now, it was just one. Uh, when I joined uh, HubSpot, I came to an acquisition called, uh, from a company called Performable. And we, we, had a high, we, were, we had about maybe 30 in the engineering team and we kind of had to turn it over. And started from like basically five to six people, 250 now. So it, it's been a busy three years and uh, 23 days. 
And so <laughs> uh, I will say that it has been fun, and I realized that I really, really, really love uh, recruiting and working with, with uh, people, talking to engineers. It's just much easier for me, right, as an engineer, to talk to them. And, but I've also come to realize that you can transfer that knowledge to the recruiter by spending that time with them every day. I mean, I literally text more with my recruiters than I do with my wife. Yeah, it's, it's crazy because we have to talk all day, all night about every candidate that is coming in. Um, who are we talking to? Who's coming the next day? What's the strategy? Negotiation. So it's, it's a really busy time, but I enjoy it. It's been a lot of fun. So I hope that you have, uh, guys have a lot of questions and that we, we can answer some of them. So my name is Ken uh, Constant Contact. So I'm the SVP of product. So responsible for everything and building our product uh, to satisfy small business customers every day. So uh, I won't be too redundant. I think we all know the, the problems here. Uh, you know, in the end, there's, I, I venture to guess, other than college hires, or maybe people coming in from unusual life circumstances, maybe um, a woman coming back after having kids, or somebody who's taken a sabbatical somewhere, um, everybody we want to hire is fully in. There's nobody on the street, unless it's a momentary thing of a startup shutting down or something like that, that is on the street for performance reasons that we're interested in. So the challenge is how do you attract the very people that should be getting a bear hug from all the folks in this room around retaining them. Now, we've had some success with that, some failures. We all lose some, we all gain some. You know, Getting that net positive is always a challenge. I think Christina just stole one of my directors so, yeah, about that, but you know. Not naming anyone. <laughs> These things happen. It's least, transfer. Right? Yeah. He, he was awesome, and he had a very typical. He had an opportunity um, at Kronos that I couldn't offer him here. Um, I don't mind losing great people to a career opportunity that allows them to do something that they can't do here. Um, but that's the story of the world we live in, right? So we've got to figure out how to create those opportunities, attract talent, um, and make sure that we retain them. Uh, at, a, at a simple level, you know, one and one A in my book in terms of priorities is aligning to customer value, making sure that every day what we're building and what products we're bringing to market um, are aligned to true customer value, solving real problems, simple, elegant solutions to, to their needs, and then having the people that can actually build those solutions and bring them to market in a fantastic way. Um, those are the biggest problems that we have. And, uh, it's cliche, I get it, we've talked about it forever, but you know, the IP walks out the door every night. Okay? So every, every piece of software we have is on its own life cycle. It's all dying on the vine every day. Um, we have to keep building it and reinvesting and re-architecting and building the next generation all the time. And if we don't have the people to do that, we're just screwed. So it just doesn't work. So, uh, so I think that we can all agree that um, this is a really relevant topic in the market that we live in. And hopefully uh, we'll have some ideas on what we can do to be better. So in terms of format, uh, I have a bunch of questions that uh, I want to ask the panelists. I'm going to start with that. Uh, but before the night is over, we're certainly going to also turn it over to all of you to ask questions. So I hope you guys have a lot of questions that you want to ask you know, our panelists here. So Elias, I actually want to start with you a little bit. Um, you. The way you describe how you view your role is uh, almost like, I think, a talent acquisition leaders rather than a uh, like dream come true. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, I mean, you've been spending all this time, you know, yeah. engaging with your recruiters, and that's not the most, that, that is actually atypical of what I think really happens out there. Any, you know, I'd love to hear from you. What was that journey like for you? And what advice can you give, uh, you know, these recruiters and talent acquisition leaders here? What can they do differently to engage their VPs of engineering or hiring managers to, to kind of get that same uh, passion that you have? I think kind of what happened to me was that I had just started a company, right? Uh, David Kess and I had started Performable, and it's just two of us. I had a most responsible for engineering and I had to hire. I mean, I, some of you I know and your companies uh, because I, I need to help recruiting. Right? It was my first time. How do I do it? And IBM, it's a whole different story. But 
I didn't know how to do it. Right? I, I love people, I love talking to engineers, but I didn't know how hard it was to hire and find them and how to test talent and, and attract them and convince them. Right? But when I, when I, so, but I knew that it was my responsibility. There's no one else that was going to do that. So I was in a very good situation. Timing was great because I just, we were just acquired about a year and nine months. We had only about five engineers. And those obviously were in my closed network. So when I joined HubSpot, one of the first things I noticed was is that we were terrible at hiring. It was a horrendous process. We had a candidate submit a resume because we had a great referral bonus. And people would just go sign up their name who wanted to interview a person. They would get together after the interview. They would do this game. And uh, some people would get hired. <laughs> And so naturally, coming from a small company, my one of my top priorities just naturally is that I got to take over this. I, I can't let any more um, candidates come in like this into the company. And so it became my responsibility. I had no choice. It, I don't know. I, um, I was, you know, not as experienced, you know, executive. So I was just doing the work that needed to be done, and, and I just focused on hiring. And I started to see the benefits of that, right? when you get great people, how much more work they could do than I could do myself. And that's when it just clicked for me. This is where I should be spending my time, because it's much more valuable. You know, obviously HubSpot knows that, that it's really, really hard. I think my hardest hire has been hiring a recruiter. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I really, really lucked out uh, with uh, one of them first early on. I spent two, two and a half, three years with that person, and we recently hired another, but we've been trying this. Really I can hire 10 engineers before I can hire a recruiter. And so it was that, that was the situation. And that's when I realized that in this work for talent, I think it's gonna have to be about what, what I had to do, you know, this is probably a Darmesh quote, but uh, product is to market, right? What the culture of your company is to recruiting. So my entire focus was I'll actually challenge you a little bit when you said it. it's about, um, I forget what you said, but you, you, said, you said one thing, and I, I say it's not really about that. It's, about, it's not about the customer. You said it, the focus is the customer and it's the product. To me, it's about building a culture that people want to join. It's like the engineers care more about that than they care about customers. It's, you teach them how to care for the customer once they come in, but they got to have a place they love, and they see it the minute they walk in. They feel it. Uh, I had a candidate this morning, and I was making a cappuccino for that person, and, and then all of a sudden, he just spent 30 minutes talking to people around the coffee machine. So they did my job, but I didn't have to do anything. And so I, I really, really, really think that the way that your company is going to differentiate itself is by the culture that they're building entirely, right, from the CEO down, and that's what's going to help you recruit people. We work really close together with my recruiters in the sense that they help me manage all the hard work of, of getting that contact from that person, but the rest we have to do it together. They can't do that by themselves, really. You know, it's like they want to know what the engineers are like. So it's just kind of, I just kind of stumbled upon that. I think I had no choice but to do that. I, I wasn't used to the, oh, I'm a VP of engineering, and I go, and there's a recruiting team, and they just hire the people for me. I didn't, I never had that problem. So I had to build it from scratch. So, you know, let's kind of dig in a little bit about, um, you know, you brought up culture, and uh, we've heard, you know, things like sexy company, non-sexy company, you know, location where people want to be, but what about, you know, culture? Um, what do you, you know, Christian, I'm kind of curious, you know, because you said Kronos is, you know, it's, uh, it's been around for a long time, and maybe I won't say it's not sexy, maybe it's a little boring for people, but how do you, you know, what do you guys do uh, in order to talk about the culture and attract people that, and make them want to be there? Sure, so, um, you know, I did the extreme approach, you know, I'm 50, I'm a woman, I'm very boring, I'm married, I, you know, all this stuff, so try jumping out of a plane, nothing. Bought a motorcycle, nothing, <laughs> you know, so that didn't work. Um, but um, 
I think it's really we are underestimating some of the talents requirements. Um, you know, I'm going to contradict you because in some ways, I look at it that 30 minutes that they spent on talking to you, that's 30 minutes lost productivity, but no offense, I'm old, so um, that's how I think. And it's very interesting because we tried that, um, you know, the Bay Area model, right? We bought in games, we bought foosball, we bought ping pong table, we bought bean bags, we got the Wii, we got everything. And you see these uh, engineers walking in, it's like, is it a test? If I'm going to play, is it going to be counted against me? Right? So it was very, very interesting. So we tried to jazz it up. We tried to make it exciting. But you can't forget who you are. I mean, that's just not who we were. So it was very interesting to, to approach it. So you have to stay true to who you are because, again, you can attract them. You can walk them through the corridor and show all the funky things. But if it's not in use, it's, it's useless. So what we try within, uh, within Kronos is really go back to some of the leveraging some of our key competences and key values. Um, indeed, customer becomes a big part of it. Um, not exaggerated, or so it's not superficial, but it comes down from a CEO on. This open door policy, the open communication, the continuous education, and investing into individuals becomes very, very critical. One of the key things we also continue to track is how much investment do we make in employees, employees' continuous education? How do we support them? Uh, how do we encourage them? How do we try to get socially engaged? How do we engage with local schools? Um, we, how do we spend our money that we allocate for various charity event. Uh, it's very well defined. Um, there are a lot of questions, how do you invest? So you be very clearly, without a doubt, defined. Also what we try to do is we don't treat young professionals as kids. They are not kids. And uh, we had to make uh, certain changes within the organization, because I mentioned to you the, the Indy, Indianapolis Tech Center, a lot of the tenured um, executives treated them like their kids, right? They wanted kids. They approached them as kids and youngsters or, you know, used various names. These are professionals with this utter curiosity that they bring in. And really, you know, it brings in various dimensions of empowerment, empowering them to make a difference and play off of the individual's curiosity and the individual need of trying to make a difference. For us, that's the only thing that works. I can't make time clock sexy. We tried the red cover, the pink cover, the blue cover. It's still a time clock, okay? Um, if we do have some very exciting technology and research that we do, we spend over $100 million on, on R&D. But again, you have this core functionality and core competency that is not that exciting. So again, that's what worked for us. You know, free meal always works, right? Um, for individuals, but we play off of some of this core competency and try not to be someone that we be are not. Because that, that the turnover is very, very high and your reputation is really screwed. Absolutely. Okay, so. I'd like to switch topics just a little bit. Um, you know, I recently uh, read a book by Ben Horowitz. I don't know if uh, everyone's up there. Ben Horowitz is uh, Mark and Reese's Sparkner on, you know, on Reese's Horowitz, the venture fund. And he wrote a book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And uh, in it, he talks about uh, recruiting quite a bit. And uh, you know he's kind of talking more about uh, senior level recruiting, but I think I think what he's saying applies across the board. And what, one of the things that was really striking to me, you know, the way he didn't quite come out and say it this way, but he implies it very strongly, is you know a consensus-driven hiring process actually doesn't work, where everyone agrees that oh we should hire someone, this person is good. Uh, in fact, he gave plenty of examples of people he hired where. Many people in the company said, oh, we shouldn't hire that person. But that person actually ended up being an amazing hire for you know, the stage that the company was. 
I'm really curious what happens inside of your organizations. How do you, you know, make these decisions? I mean, you know, we, you know, there's, I mean, Google is famously known for its consensus-driven approach, where everyone has to agree, at least, kind of my, that's my understanding of it. I may be wrong, but, but I'd love to more really understand what happens inside of your companies. How do you guys make those decisions? Who wants to lead with them? Anyone lead with that? So, so we're probably a little bit um, more on the consensus side most days. Um, the, the hiring manager is ultimately the decision maker. So the hiring manager, I would expect to be able to um, evaluate that talent um, and be able to figure out what feedback is relevant and what isn't, uh, and depending on the source of that feedback and what that feedback is, um, be able to make a good call. Uh, so we don't sit there and tally all the thumbs up or you know everybody has formal votes. Uh, but there's a big difference between saying, hey, I don't think that this person values our cultural norms, okay? which, to your point, could be a showstopper right away. So honesty, integrity, respect for the people they're working with, all of those kind of things are non-negotiable. Um, if somebody sits there and says, hey, you know, we're hiring for a job person, and uh, you know, this person's got you know, 10 years of really solid experience, but they're a little light on Java, and there's some Java genius that's sitting there evaluating them, going, well, they can't keep up with me. There's no way that I'm going to hire this person for a senior. Okay? But the hiring manager sees the talent, sees the, the aptitude, trusts the learning curve, has good insights into how they've attacked other learning opportunities. That's perfectly legit to say, thanks for the input. You know, we're we're going to hire this person. Um, but we try not to do a lot of hard and fast rules. So the biggest thing, um, I, I always talk about it a lot, um, I use the phrase conscious decision making. I don't like making decisions by default, yes or no. Okay? I want somebody to make a decision consciously knowing the pros and cons that have been put in front of them. So when it comes to hiring, all I want to do is guarantee that there's been an open dialogue and people have been heard. Because in my experience, overriding somebody's feedback is not nearly as damaging as having them think you didn't hear their feedback. Okay? Um, and I've hired people for my staff in the last year, uh, replaced like three staff roles, and I always say the same thing. You know, nobody ever has the same damn opinion about you know candidates. There's always something that I like this one better, or that one better, or this and why. And the only thing I can do is make sure that I listen and listen carefully to what that feedback is, and then make a call. So, uh, so our culture is, is pretty much uh, driven by that hiring manager's decision and uh, a lot of them. Yeah, we, because we're much smaller, like I said, about 150 people, and I hiring about three, four engineers a month, I basically make all the decisions, right? Early on, I, I had the ability to conduct the interview myself, do one or two sessions, and just hire the person on the But I figured, I realized that that wouldn't scale. So my, my, my job was to change it from that consensus model where people were really just doing this. I don't know if you got, you, you know what I'm talking about, I'm in the right room. And it was just a nightmare because people were influencing each other. And what we did is instead, first I was making the decision, I started bringing people in. Um, then I was better. But later I said, I gotta train people. I just don't, in, in my lessons what I've learned is that in three years of working with this team, our hiring managers, our tech leads, let's say, we really don't have hiring managers. My job is to grow the team. Right? We're still at that stage. Not a, not a lot of people in the organization have all the experience in making that decision. So that's why I cannot let them, they don't have the context, right? They don't know the situation, they don't know how many people we have hired recently, did we hire more junior, did we hire more senior, what are the needs of the, across the whole organization? Um, and, and so it hasn't been possible. But what I've done, right, my job has been to train people at, that are side by side with me, like a director of engineering, the recruiters, to learn how to make those decisions. So I'm away, I'm on vacation or something, go ahead, hire, I trust them, now, right? <coughs> but the, the interview, the, the team that is interviewing, like tech leads and, and senior software engineers, their job is to learn, and that we have this agreement, right? They know that they're not there to, uh, to make the decision for themselves, but they want to learn. They're like asking, what do you think about this person? I like them. And they're like, what did you see? What did you capture? So it's a learning engagement for everyone in the team that is participating in the interviewing. Um, obviously, I want their, their buy-in uh, of the cultural, um, you know, what they see uh, about, the, about, the, about the candidates, 
but they know they're not making a decision. So we, we cannot, I don't know, I just don't work on consensus. Consensus leads to average or less. You gotta trust somebody to make the decision. Maybe just to follow up on that point, I, I think that one of the critical factors is who is in the interview and why are they there, right? So uh, it, it's that, that, again, we all live in the cliche land and, and there's always a little bit of a, a grain of truth in that, but uh, A players like to work with A players. You know, and we like to believe that everybody's an A player. They're not. We know that. We'd like to say that every single hire is. We try to do everything we can to bring that in. But the only guarantee is if you have people that you don't trust their judgment on the recruiting side and the interview side, then you're, you're handicapping yourself immediately. So I couldn't agree more that there's some people that have that trust that they can really figure out what's going on on a technical skill versus a cultural fit versus a combination. And the key is to make sure that you've got your best people on the front lines of that interview because if even if it's just a, a, a hard ass interview process there's people that thrive with that that says oh you're you guys are serious i want a serious company i want to solve serious problems every day and if this is a place that it's that hard to get into that's awesome i mean how many times have we heard that about google right like um, google almost has this reputation of because there's such a pain in the ass they're attracting more candidates like can i prove myself there and I think that all of us are served better by having our best people attract the best people that we can. And if you're seeing an interview loop as an HR person, that you actually just saw your, you know, your performance rankings or HPOR, whatever process you use, and you see people in the wrong quadrants interviewing, like you should be screaming bloody murder. Say, how the hell am I going to attract an A if you got me with your C players in the interview loop? Um, it just doesn't make any sense. I have to agree with both of you. It's every time you bring someone in, it's you're assuming a risk. And through this collaboration and disagreements, I look at them as, as risk mitigation. You know what you're going to get yourself into. Um, and no, you can't hire by consensus. It doesn't work because we don't always assume the same risks. And um, you have to be very, very careful on what you are asking for. I agree with you that if it's not a cultural fit, it doesn't even pass our recruiter's table. Right? It just stops there. So by the time it gets to you, it's really a collaboration and understanding the risk that you are taking on through these kind of disagreements, you're flushing it out. And um, don't forget, as Ken mentioned, you're never going to get it right all the time. So if you are trying to get it right uh, most of the time, you are doing much better. At the scale we are in, I, I can't possibly touch all the candidates, even though I'm you know, uh, a little bit OCD, I would love to, it's just impossible to do so. But uh, you have to trust that people understand how to flush some of those risks out, and when you actually did make a mistake, you, you need to act on it. It is, becomes much more critical than actually uh, bringing it the right down, then, but no consensus. So. I, I think that one thing that comes to mind is that one thing that I try to avoid HubSpot is to be in the situation you probably find yourselves in where you're under the pressure of bringing in candidates, right? And maybe the higher manager might be busy or uh, it's not, oh, they have a different opinion of the candidate that they're looking for. There's a mismatch, right? And so there's this pressure. You gotta bring in people or the higher managers, I just need someone and you just, the problem is that we all are constantly tempted to lower the bar and just to satisfy that number, right? And, and so with my recruiting team, we're in complete alignment, right? We, so a month I might not hire anybody. And then another month of June, we hired 10 people, right? It was like a crazy month for us. And so we, um, it doesn't matter, right? We, I, I kind of control that and make sure I help people. Like right? sometimes I have my engineers say, because why don't you want to hire that person? And I push them and I say, well, we want to raise the bar. Let's slow down. Let's do this. We did. And so that's it. It has to be a, a, an alignment 100%, top to bottom. The CEO cannot come and tell me I'm not hiring fast enough or I'm hiring too fast. I always will hire whoever I find that is awesome that month. It doesn't matter to me. Right? And if I didn't hire anybody, then I don't care. I don't, I don't, you know, I'm against like, being worried about those reports so much because I care about every single person that enters the room. So it's something that you, you, gotta, you, gotta, you guys have to pay attention to. That. 
if you find yourself at my recruiter, sometimes do this to me. They're like, oh, yes, meet this person, meet this person. And, like, and I'm like, no, no, just like, don't push me. Right? And that's something that we all have to work together. Sometimes they remind me of the recruiter, sometimes my engineers. We all go in every direction. Very important. One quick comment. I also do value employee referral tremendously. Because they understand the culture, they understand the value, and uh, probably they are relatively tenured by the time they refer either their neighbors or their sons or their cousins or their um, better half, so they, they really behalf, uh, be, they speak on behalf of Carlos. Yeah. All, all great points, and uh, yeah, the, as you bring up a really great point, which is you know, making sure there's that alignment between uh, the, the hiring leader, you know, someone like yourself, and you know, the talent acquisition side, because you know, we know sometimes, um, for example, the incentive system. Recruiters sometimes are incentivized on the hires they make, and so they're, they're looking and saying, hey, I gotta make my numbers. It's like sales. Um, so if there's not that full alignment, you know, you, you gotta create tensions over that. And I think that, that does tend to happen. Um, you know, one place I wanna explore a little more, so we, we kind of got into the conversation of the actual evaluation process. How do you evaluate someone? And, uh, you know, we, so Google came up, and so let's pick on Google a little bit. And you know, Google pioneered the approach of you know the, the ask really hard questions. You know, uh, ask those you know, brain teasers. Look at someone's GPA, their SAT scores. You know, I mean, Google was notorious for this. And then I'm guessing. Most of you noticed that about a year ago, they came out and said, hey, you know all the stuff we've been doing, we basically went back and studied it and realized there's no correlation between any of those things, and people who perform really no better at Google. And so my question to you guys is, you know, here's a company that, you know, kind of had this really rigorous process, and thought they were doing all the right things, and luckily for us, at least, uh, they are heavily data oriented. So they actually, went. and I actually met with the guy. I actually had the pleasure of uh, meeting with the person who did the study at, at Google. It was a very, really fascinating conversation we had because you know this was so deep into the organization, right? I mean, the belief that these things work was so deep in the organization when confronted with the data. The initial reaction was the data can't be right. No, the data is right. What do you guys do? How do you, how do you evaluate? Oh, this has got that. Let <laughs> <laughs> me say, I, I don't want to knock on Google too hard because they, they really have, the, they're in a unique situation, right? They, they have the biggest challenges that we're doing in technology. HubSpot is, is building a marketing platform, right? We're, we, I don't, we, we don't need rocket scientists, right? We, we need great fit attitude, you know, um, we call it GSD, we call it JFDI, just fucking do it, done is better than perfect. Those are our models, right, sir? I will always hire more fit than I do on skills. I don't look at GPAs, I don't look at schools. It, none of those things matter to me, right? It, it's, uh, there, there are many, there's so many variables to this, but um, first, for example, our questions tend to be easier. I'm not out there trying to puzzle the engineer and like completely block it, right? I understand what engineers want, right? They want, uh, they, they know that it's not about building an a, a new algorithm every day. They care more about what's the situation on a daily basis. They care about what's the culture, what's our, our, our process, what's our infrastructure. How do we balance the desires of the engineer versus the desires of the product and the company? Um, I will, we'll ask basic questions that I, I want to see them programming. I want to ask them questions that are more applicable to what we do on a daily basis. I want to see how quickly they answer. Uh, we will shift between their computer, online, a blog, a, a board, and we want to analyze everything, right? It's like how they, how they, how they responded to it, right? I want people that have had, we, have, we tend to hire a lot of people fresh out of college as well, but those are very tough hire, because 
they don't know how good they have it when they join HubSpot. <laughs> I like it when they go somewhere else first, because I want them to see something. I have the most trouble is with people that come straight out of college. So I'm looking for that kind of experience, right? I want, I know, I want to understand exactly where this individual is, what are their goals, what is it that they want to do, do they really want to start a new company, are they ready for that? How can I help them get the experience that they need for their next step? And so it's really about building a relationship. The rest is about what we've done at HubSpot. So engineering team, we have invested heavily in training, right? In mentorship, in onboarding, in ramp ups, in training the tech leads to uh, detect issues when we make a mistake hiring really early on. So we can, you know, the risk mitigation no, is more about like how can we take more risk? We, we're, we're like, let's take a risk. One person, one, one, eight, one of my top engineers said, why did you want to hire this person? Blah, blah, blah. They're like complaining about this individual. Elias just wanted to take a bet on this person. And I said, well, I have to get a bet on every single person in this room, right? And so it's like, that's what this is about, right? So we do that by working with it. I want to work with an individual that says, I want to, I want to learn. This is what I've done before. This is my experience. This is what I'm looking for. And I know if I have the right place for them. So those things go up to me much, much farther if I can build that relationship in the report, then, then how much you know, we can teach. I mean, if they study engineers, if they've done some work before, the, 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 the most they, the, the least they have to unlearn the better, right? But other than that, we'll teach them. Okay, Christina, yeah, so I think it's a it's a very broad question and it, it kind of cuts across different kind of disciplines and domains to have different answers. Uh, you know, what we're looking for in a DBA and how we test a DBA skill is going to be different than a developer. Um, so I, I don't think there's a one size fits all, but the things that, that I'll, I'll just give in my personal opinion rather than trying to speak for all of our hiring managers. but. Um, my personal opinion is that you look for previous success, okay? So you want to see how somebody has performed in previous lives that's still the best indicator of future success, I think, overall. Um, I look for problem solvers. So one of my favorite questions is still, you know, what's the, what's the biggest problem that you've ever solved? Um, what was the hardest problem you ever solved? Why was that the hardest problem? What, what's the accomplishment you're most proud of? You know, how they talk about those things are important. Um, there's obviously a lot of um, technique work that any engineer in our organization has to go through, whether that's architectural, you know, some of the basic ones. Okay, so show me the architecture of the system you're supporting today. Can you explain it to me? Can you, if I was a new employee, walk me through your code base and how it would work? You know, to show me your techniques if I was a junior programmer, how would you be coaching me on techniques, your dudes, your dudes, your ten commandments? Like, what's showing up in terms of their aptitude and ability to not only display their own talent, but show that they know how to work that talent within the context of a team. Um, so we're all, I think most of us are some version of Agile uh, these days. I've always thought that um, people have blown by a little too casually the fact that um, Agile puts greater requirements on an engineer than any previous generation of technology and, and methodology. They have to talk to people. They have to engage with people. They have to be active problem solvers in a team environment. Those things don't let them hide their kind of, you know, the old thing of raw meat over the wall to the brilliant person, okay? They have to have some soft skills, at least soft skills, to be able to work with a product manager, looking over their shoulder saying, what is that, you know, what should this do, how should it work? So we're looking at all of those things, trying to figure out the best way to display that. Um, but, you know, I think to Eliza's point, point there, uh, simple formula for me, talent times effort equals results. Okay, and you know, there's people that will simply outwork others. There's people that will bring an energy and an engine that says even if they don't know something, they'll learn it. If they haven't solved that problem before, they'll figure it out. And there's that there's an intellectual curiosity at the core of a great engineer, in my opinion, that if you can figure out how to bring that out and get them talking about what they're passionate about, it gives you way more insight into what they're about and what they're gonna how they're going to fit into your team than having them take a damn test or like I got a question once that was like oh so tell me how many Starbucks there are in the United States like okay and like help I had to go through that now it's like I came pretty close by the way that was pretty good but like, it was I didn't find that useful at all because there's people that like puzzles and there's people that like solving engineering problems and they're not you know those Venn diagrams don't always overlap so why the hell would I kick somebody out who's not a puzzle person be just because like I thought that that was a cute way of filtering. Um, so you know that would be my take of some of the things that we value and how we try to flush out that uh, that talent. 
I, I agree with both of you. I think it's very, very important that, uh, that intellectual curiosity I always test for. Um, I also, it's very different at the various level you hire individual contributors versus people managers and so forth. Um, but I also tell the candidate to tell me the story behind your resume. Don't recite your resume. I know your resume. I read it. I probably memorized it. What's the story? How do you evolve in your career? And what made you change decisions? Um, where you recruited multiple times, you know there is a talent that people gravitate to. And there is very interesting way of you can find um, behind the story, uh, behind their professional career, how they make decisions, how they solve problems, what makes them tick, what excites them. Can I actually compete with that level of excitement? So are they going to be a long-term contributing employee with the company? Um, so I always say, you know, what is the story? What's the story behind your uh, professional life? And it's very interesting what you find. Yes. Oh, One thing to keep in mind is that I, I know we're talking about testing, but you just got a little bit the oh, discussion on that. It, it's two ways, right? It's like I feel like I'm selling as much as I am testing, right? Mm -hmm. And so yes. if we're testing, if we're testing too much, that means we we are getting lower quality talent than the one we really want, right? Because we're more focused on the test than. I like to put, I like to feel myself I'm in the position with the candidate where I have to sell, right? When we're trying to bat, you know, above our average. Where I'm like, you know, I enjoy having a good conversation with the Google, right? And say, like, finding out what the problem, finding the kink in the armor of, like, <laughs> what is it that appeals to this person and how can I do it? Even though they're getting paid like $300,000 a year, right? uh, and just like five years of school. And so, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, something to keep in mind, right? Yeah, we, absolutely. Testing is not as important because sometimes I've hired people like five minutes into the conversation. I'm like, let's stop talking, let's, let's continue talking, but there's no testing done. I, I will hire you, <laughs> it's not a problem. But, but go ahead, tell me your story. Uh, but that's, a, we have, it's, it's about like selling and how you have to go after people that you never think you could hire. Can I try one, one more? <laughs> Sorry, so there's, obviously this is what we do for um, the, um, so I'll, I'll throw one other piece out of that just to, um, uh, well, not really devil's advocate, but um, to, I've, I've really changed my approach to recruiting, um, and actually personally as well, so this would be my advice to anybody. But, um, they, yes, you're selling, okay, but I'm a big believer in brutal, honest selling. That you, you talk about yourself with brutal honesty, weaknesses, strengths, what it actually is, as a way of attracting somebody who is fond of that kind of environment, okay? So if you got some, if you have a particular quirk, you know, we're all very different companies. My guess is we have more technology overlaps than we do cultural overlaps in some ways, okay? But we are who we are. And the second you try to pretend that you're Google to attract somebody from Google or compete with somebody who's got an offer or like we're going after the same candidate and we both are there, like I want that candidate to pick the best job for them. I genuinely do. I want them to pick the place that they're going to be happy, motivated, and excited to show up every day. And if it's not me, God bless. Go for it. You deserve it. Life's too short. You get too many options in this marketplace to sit there and say, take a job that you, eh, you know, I talked them into it and then they're pissed off and it's not quite the same. And, you know, it turns out that nobody actually sits around and, you know, talks at the cap cappuccino machine every day. It was an unusual thing. Like, what is it that is really honest about that? And then live or die on, on your strengths. Um, so, for whatever it's worth. No, I think you're absolutely right. I don't mean selling them, like lying to them. No, but let me, let me give you some examples of that. Um, for example, I do I do believe though that what I mean by selling is that you have to attract that candidate. Right? It, it's not going to be like come over here and I'm going to test you. No one wants to be tested. You word. Yeah, and so they they hate that the most, right? It, it's a very for example, I teach my interviewers that it's about asking questions, but the minute you know this person is going to fail, we have to treat them very respectfully. And we have to help them, and they have to come out of there as a learning experience, right? 
So, because I need that referral to come back later, right? Okay, people need to know that we, we care about them, it's not just due to their numbers. As an example of honesty, for example, one of the things that we do culturally is that we, we run the surveys, we, we care a lot about feedback, right? And so every two weeks, engineers, about 30% answer. Just one single question, are you happy? Are you being heard? All kinds of questions like that. And so sometimes the candidates ask me, what is it like here? What are the weaknesses? Firm, firmly, I think you have to believe you're the best place to work. If not, it's going to be tough. So I don't really send people away too much. I want them to come to me. But I will open the survey, and I will like I don't even know the results of that week, and I'll just like let's look at them together, and they start reading the raw feedback that we're getting anonymously from my from my engineers. And for example, that's I'm just sharing a secret, right? It's like, it just blows them away. They immediately trust, and they say. Wow, this is, oh yeah, that person complained, it, that person, well, this person loves it, this person hates it. And um, we, yeah, I want them to see exactly what it's like, as much as I can possibly do in like three, four hours of being there, fully transparent. Yeah, I, I have to agree again. Not we got to find something we disagree on. I know. You guys still awake out there? What's your favorite? Soccer game or yeah. something out yeah. uh, there. But um, again, as, as both of you said, the employee wants, they really have to want to work for you. It's one thing that you want them to work for you, but they want to have to work for you. And um, I usually try to get brutal honesty, you know, and sometimes it's exaggerated in, in some cases, because I want to have, know them, that what they get themselves into. They really have to know. And um, because that's how you're going to be able to the other thing is very important in, in my opinion is that most of the individuals, most of the professionals want to make a difference, right? That's why they invested in their education, that's why they invested in their career, and they want to genuinely make a difference. They want to deliver substance. So if you can articulate how their day-to-day -day contribution makes a difference in the company's success, I think that alone attracts a lot of good talents. Oh, so, good. <laughs> so I have one last question for the panel, and then I'm going to open it up to all of you. Uh, so very quickly, one question I have is, um, <clears throat> yeah, we've talked a lot about culture fit, you know, uh, different motivations and things like that. And however, you know, what I notice in our business, and when we work with customers and users who tend to be mostly you know, recruiters, especially, you know, as I said, we focus on engineering hiring. The first place, you know, when a new requirement or a new you know, opening comes up, the first thing is, you know, they put a big laundry list of skill sets. And search for that laundry list of skill sets. And if anyone who doesn't have that laundry list just gets disqualified. And, you know, it's, it's particularly frustrating to me because I come from an engineering background and I will take someone who has the ability, who's done great things and has the ability to learn over whether or not they know the latest version of, you know, whatever software out there. How do you guys think about this and how do you work with your teams on this? Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually am a strong, firm believer of a true competency modeling, right? Um, so don't shoot me for an engineer. Um, I do believe the skills and the knowledge and the soft skills side of the thing. So I really think there is some basic fundamental skill that I really don't want to invest in. Just purely, not because they are not talented enough, but I choose not to invest in because i rather go and acquire. I don't want to teach C. I don't want to teach Java. I don't want to teach Java scripting. But I do want to teach industry-specific experience, that application-specific, that's more tailored in the knowledge side. So I do look for that basic fundamental knowledge, not because I don't think that someone who you know learned long time ago, C or even Fortran or whatever programming languages out there, 
cannot pick up a new programming language. I intentionally choose not to invest in educating them on those specific basic fundamental skills and rather focus on building up the knowledge that is job specific where I you know we briefly talked about. Uh, now it's very different for college hires where we have a very long drawn out education program and onboarding program that's lasts about 18 months. That's a very different story. But it's purely by choice. We have success. We disagree. disagree. Um, <laughs> no, it's just a preface. I think I, I really I really don't mind teaching. I, I think you all know this is you know, recruiting is a long term play. Uh, I I just rejoice, you know, when, when my recruiters say, I've been working with this guy for a year, he just responded. He wants to come and talk. Something happened, right? At their company. They're doing going under, or they're really tired of their manager. Most people leave managers at their companies, they don't they don't leave the companies, they leave their managers. Uh, we have to be very patient. Uh, we meet people for coffee all the time and we're not making progress that day. But it might happen six months later. And so to me it's about meeting people. I'm always meeting them. Everyone I can in town, every engineer, every designer, every product manager, uh, every front end developer, back end developer, DevOps person, whoever I can, because you never know when the right time is going to be. And so we don't we don't do any matching of of keywords. So we're just contacting people. We meet them. We see if they would be amazing at our, our, with our team, and we just keep an eye. Right? We have to stay uh, be very watchful. And when the right time it comes, it comes. And, and so it's been it's been amazing working at, us, at our scale, but you know, 150, where we don't have like that three-person startup where they need an iOS developer, and that's the only thing they will look for. We just look for great people. And when the right time comes, we have to take. It. So that's our approach. There's no there's no skill matching. Uh, the only kind of biggest category is: Are you a front-end developer? Are you a back-end developer? We believe in specialization. I don't think you can possibly be a full stack engineer. Those people don't exist. Don't lie to yourselves or to your hiring managers. I call them unicorns. I have one in my team. You either are a very creative person that can do front end development and wants to do that, and then you have the more traditional engineer who just wants to work on big systems, algorithm, databases, operations. Those people cannot write HTML or CSS. Or and so we just, that's the biggest category we split. And then we, we look for them, we find them, and we develop them, and we teach them. We built a lot of infrastructure technically to be very attractive to engineers so they can come and want to be part of that and learn that. We build things that you know, Twitter now has you know, with you know, two or 3,000 engineers. We have it with 150, right? You know, Heroku platform as a service. We'll have things that Google has just started to open source projects like this. That's how we, we attract them, right? They want to work on those things. We teach them. We have to teach them. If I wait to, if I if I can find an age based developer experience, I'm never going to find it. Not in Boston either. So I have to teach them. It just has to be the right person. And most people that say they know something is because they target it. Right? They're looking how to fill that keyword in their in their resume and their LinkedIn profile, and they don't know enough about it. So I actually don't want this. I want the person that is smart enough to come and learn it but they can prove that they learn other things because they really enjoy that and they had a passion for those things. And that's the, the harder test. And that only comes through getting to know them. And we have to invest the time, meet them personally. So I'll give this a big old, it depends. Uh, so there's times that we got a rifle shot and this is what we need and it's very specific and you know, we, you know, we're gonna send out, I don't know, 70 billion emails this year and Damn it, we, we don't have time to teach somebody in our back end syndication team that we've got a senior opening and like the junior will figure out how to make this person what we need a year or 18 months from now. We can't wait that long. And in that case, we're looking for a very specific profile, which is, I completely agree, fundamentally limiting. Okay? So there's no doubt about it. Um, other times, if it's an entry level or an associate or uh, you know, you know, just a talent hire, we can do that as well. 
But we hired over 50 folks into my team in the first half of this year. We'll hire another 50 in the second half. We've always got something open. Okay, so there's no reason for any of our recruiters to go, oh my God, I have blinders on and I have this person who's really, really good and they're a front-end developer, but you know, that wreck is over there. <laughs> I think Marcus would kill himself if he thought we lost a, uh, you know, a great talent because we tried to put a square peg into a round hole and failed. It's like, find a goddamn round hole. You know, we will find somebody for the round hole, we'll get this person over here, and if we got a round hole into a square hole, we'll let them grow into it you know, from time to time. But we'll figure it out. So, uh, so I just think it depends, um, and we've got, you know, we're big enough and we have enough openings that we don't, um, we don't really lack for attracting the, the talent based upon the search, but maybe my last thought is that, I mean, all of us have talents that we perceive as the core of what we bring to the table, right? So I bet you every recruiter in here knows how they would describe themselves as a recruiter, right? And if a company tells you what kind of recruiter they're looking for, it allows you to kind of self-select and say, is this a company that talks about it the same way I do, that thinks about it, that uses the same tools or techniques, okay? Engineers are just like that. You know, it's still fairly unusual to say somebody's got a 10-year Java background and back end is suddenly applying for a front-end, you know, JavaScript job. Like, it, I mean, they want to know, what are you doing with Java? Like, do you, does it fit? So I always just say, be honest, cast a wide net, and stay the hell flexible. Uh, because if you find somebody that's got really good talent, you'll find the right place for them. Just one comment on that, um, which is very similar to what Ken you said, is you never stop recruiting. It's really the key, even if you don't have a rack. But you always keep your eyes open for the talent. Somebody and might take one of your directors. And exactly. You, have, <laughs> you better, you you better, you better have your toe in the water on the director. <laughs> <Get her up. laughs> I'll give you one. I got to change the list. <laughs> indeed. Uh, but you never stop. So indeed, when there are some specific regs, when you solicit your your HR business partner to fill it. You know, I tend to be very, very specific, so at least they have an idea of what they are looking for, but you never stop looking. Great. Thank you very much. So I'd love to go to our audience. Anyone have a question they want to ask? Sorry? Okay. So if you could just, you know, introduce yourself uh, with your name and where you work. Pam Lemon, Ipswich, Talent Acquisition Manager. So anyone from the panel can answer this. You all seem very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, engaged with your recruiters and, and the fact that our job is not always easy. How do you get your hiring teams, the, um, the members of your hiring teams, to, to be that without saying, oh God, i got to run to this interview two minutes before, not prepared, not as engaged in the hire as you are? That's what I find is, is the challenge part. I wish my managers were more like you. Yeah, some of them are, not all, but. But your teams, how do you get your interview teams more um, engaged in that? Um, it's a, it is a challenge, by the way, because, um, you know, and Bridget is here to keep me honest. It's, <laughs> I wish I could say everybody is just as engaged and prompt and so forth, uh, but they are not. They're looking at it from a different perspective. And a lot of the managers, they are focusing on the day-to-day -day activities as opposed to really focusing on building out the, the skill set within their organization. And um, it becomes very, very frustrating. But that's when you have to really escalate it to the manager and work with me closely. And you really set the example. You make it important, and it becomes important. Um, I, in the past, I got to the very, very extreme that I made it very, very simple without the, um, you know, lowering the bar because it's very important. I think we pointed out earlier you can't lower the bar. But I did set the uh, stage saying you have 30 days, 60 days. If you don't feel the wreck, the wreck is going to someone else. It's very simple as that. And my HR business partner kept me honest. So either you care to participate in the interview or I'll bring someone in that I feel that is a fit. And by the way, if you're not participating, I really don't need you long term. And people tend to take me seriously because I prove it over and over again that if you're not participating, I really don't have any use for you. So, um, but it, it, I have to admit, it's not an easy task. 
you have you done? If I extend on this question, um, sure. we've been trying to, and it's hard because of timing, but engaged in like a, a round table before the interview, as the interview process starts to kick off. Does that work to get them around um, how this person is not all the time? Impact? Okay, so it, it works occasionally. Then it works occasionally when people are actually in the same geographic location, but it's a very virtual team. There is always someone's going to missing, all right? So, and then I find just like with the Tom, there are a lot of influencing that takes place, and you really want more of a candid feedback. So, um, sometimes it works, but I didn't find that it works all the time to institute it. It's really what works for me is in some way the reward, but also the, the penalty. You fail the wreck or you lose the wreck. So a little bit of a suck up for my team and maybe a challenge to this audience. Um, don't let it happen. <laughs> okay? So you guys are the recruiters. I, I feel really lucky to have the team that we have because we have open dialogue around that stuff. Um, I, I think Brenda can vouch for this. Like if, if I find out that a hiring manager's got one of our precious recs that's trying to build our precious team, the thing that we care about most, and they're indifferent to the process, and they're not rigorous in the way that they're approaching it, there's, that's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. And if you guys let that happen, and you take one of your precious recruits that you just spent a year cultivating to get in, and you got a no-show on the interview, where three people are asking them the same goddamn question, what message does that send to the candidate yeah. that says, these guys aren't rigorous, they aren't taking it seriously, this must not be important to them. Okay? So I'd say that you're complicit in the problem if you let that happen. And if you want to be recruiting in a place that has people that don't give a shit, then like then don't give a shit. Okay? If you if you care about that, escalate it. And if you're not getting the answer from the hiring manager or the boss, then go work someplace that does. Because you work too hard to not have somebody give a shit about what you do. Right? One thing you mentioned my favorite word, process. Yes, I agree what you're saying, but I like to have the ownership of that process be by the most people affected by it. Right? We have developed our hiring process by the engineers. Right? Yeah. By the engineers, for the engineers. Because if recruiting were to come in from above and tell me how to do it, we would hate it and we wouldn't show up. Okay. So we all have to work together in doing that. But there has to be a process. And they, you gotta have the discipline. Next question. Work our way back here. Alan? And you can introduce yourself. And you just keep uh, Alan from Startup Institute. How do you guys evaluate um, for soft skills? Because you guys all mentioned it, um, but it's somewhat intangible and squishy. So how do you guys actually do the evaluation for it? It's, it's intangible and squishy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I like the story behind the resume because it does reference a lot of the soft skills. Now, are there some really good artists out there and they try to read your mind? I usually tell them, please don't try to read my mind because, you know, I'm married for 30 years and my husband didn't master it, so, you know, in the five minutes you're not going to do that. Um, so you really have to play and, and read that out. But a lot of the questioning I think Ken brought out uh, earlier when we had the topic of discussion does allude to some of the soft skill and you know situation play again you're taking a risk but being honest they actually end up self-selecting because not everybody can play eight ten hours a day uh, you know five days six days a week over time they just say you know what I this is the role I'm not gonna play so they themselves self-select before you make an offer. Uh, they can only pretend for so long. So having that brutal honesty really helps. And I, I think that, so I would agree, it's squishy. You know, it's very hard to, to kind of screen in a, in a hard way for a soft skill. But I think that over time, especially folks in this room, they can help, especially newer managers and newer hiring people, on some of the questions that are more likely to elicit a truthful response more likely to give you the insight in a way that an engineer will be happy to answer. Okay, like we've all got them. I mean, some of them are completely textbook and some of them are anti-textbook. I'm sure some of my favorite interview questions for soft skills 
break all the rules on what really is going to be indicative. But like, I want to know who their favorite boss was and why. I want to know who their least favorite boss was and why. I want to know the last time they had a technical argument with a peer and how it got resolved. I want, to, like, I want to poke at things that give me some insight that they represent some sort of real situation that gives me some insight into how do they behave. And you know, there's lots of ways to do that. You can ask perfectly legitimate questions to be able to get some insight. In the end, it's still interpreting whether that's an okay thing for your culture. It's still an okay, like, oh, was that too aggressive or not aggressive? Did, did, did that indicate that there? I heard that he wasn't a good listener. I heard that he was. You know, well, wow, what, why? And at that point, you just got to, you know, trust the judgment of the folks that are going to be able to make the decision. Right. Let's go to the next one. Next Hi. Um, my name is Emily. I work for a nonprofit called Girls Who Code. Um, we encourage girls to pursue careers in technology. So you probably Love know that. what my question's going to be related to. <laughs> Love that. Love um, that. Yeah. So I'm curious if there are any things you guys have found that really have worked in terms of getting girls in the door or things integrated into your culture that has been effective in keeping them in or things that organizations like us can do to help you guys increase the talent pool. Um, yeah, thoughts on that. So, so I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this one, so I'll throw it out there. Um, I still think that the number one thing you can do is um, make sure that you walk the walk. If you have female leadership in your engineering organization, it sends a strong message on the openness, and it's not a boys club or the frat club or any of that kind of crap. Um, I think that we do a lot of soft things around that, but we're really proud of our female leadership in our organization, and we cultivate that. So as an example, just before this, we had our first class of our what we call our software engineering development program. We've got eight college hires that came in together that are going into a uh, first time we put together a rotational assignment program to be able to uh, kind of enter into the workforce better, hopefully be stickier, create relationships with some really good talent. We insisted that there was going to be a percentage of females because we have a percentage of females in leadership and the two leaders for that program both happen to be two of our strongest um, engineering leads, which are both women, okay? And right out of the gate, in college recruiting, we stand out. Right. So um, ultimately that doesn't happen by accident. There's things that are different about a diverse environment versus a uh, kind of a single sex environment, which a lot of engineering organizations are these days. But you have to work hard and we have the advantage of we've been lucky to be able to attract the leadership that gives us that time. Sure. Um, I think uh, you mentioned uh, Marcus earlier today that there is various events that are happening even around Boston that really fostering uh, young female uh, entering technology field, the technovation with the five individuals going into these um, interesting events. There is um, Kronos also hosts uh, women in technology events on the regular basis to get them together. And interestingly enough, the last woman in technology event I participated that was in our technology center in Indianapolis most of the audience was not necessarily dominated by women, but there was a lot of men in there that they actually wanted to understand what is the role of a woman in technology. Um, it was a very interesting mix, but uh, also working with various institutions, uh, higher education institutions in the area that um, we do on like similar concept as cloud uh, crowdsourcing. Uh, we work with the institution to develop curriculum or, or very specific um, examples that the, the kids can work on or the young adults can work on and uh, we tailor it sometimes a girl problem or a woman problem uh, and how do you use technology to solve those kind of problems. So we do try to foster but um, you have to be making sure that you don't fall on the other end because you don't just hire women just because they are women. You are not hire um, you know, various cultures because adding diversity. You are hiring them because they bring in a different perspective that makes you better. And you have to play on that tone. Um, you have to make sure that they understand the value that they bring in, the diversity, and the diversity that introduce different, uh, looking at different perspective, different problem solving, and that's how you really start fostering this. Um, it is a challenge, but you know, just like Ken said, 
lead by examples, have a couple of very talented individuals, people tend to gravitate to them. Either it's a different race or it's a different gender or it's a different background, uh, you'll find that the diversity will come. I just want one other thought. If, if you think it's hard to do hire engineers, hiring female engineers is even ridiculously hard. I think that the, the little anecdote, I think, from, um, from our college recruiting. Um, so we had a booth set up, and it was RIT, if I remember right. And uh, we, we had the SEDP program, so we're getting lots of people in the booth. And we met these two very bright, very talented young women. And we're all excited about it. And we're like, hey, you know, we should get you um, out to, for our internship program and get you started and all this stuff. And uh, this was, I believe, uh, November or December of this past year. And uh, they're like, oh, yeah, well, that's great, but we've already got line, our internships lined up for next summer. And I'm at Google and I'm at uh, Facebook. And they were freshmen. <laughs> November of freshman year of college, sitting there with two blue chip um, you know, internships before Christmas. Like, pretty amazing. A few more, few more questions. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, I'm Kate Morgan. I'm a Boston HCB consulting firm. On the heels of that, what sort of sense of responsibility do you have? To keep our students local. And we have this huge, you know, like we're just basically exporting out to the Bay Area. And we're not doing anything to basically come here. And to that point, nobody seems to be able to hire college interns or even full time in September because they say, well, we don't know what we're going to have available in June. There's not this sense of just go for it. And you guys are three pretty prominent companies. So I'm just curious of what your sense of responsibility is. Um, thank you for the question. Um, every year for the last four years, we hire interns for summer jobs, probably between 40 and 50, um, on average, from the local community. Now, some of it not necessarily going to local schools, but they are resident uh, of the community and they are coming back home. But we do recruit from mainly from the local um, schools. And uh, we do give precedence uh, for them or, or advantage when they come back for the second and third term. And we also specifically, out of budget within engineering, have on average here in Massachusetts around 20 to 25 new recs that we open that exclusively to be filled by new grad in the area. That's out of the budget because, again, we are taking a risk. We are just bringing them in, and it depends where they fall within the organization. Um, and that's how we deal with them. Again, as I mentioned, I work with the curriculum developers with some of the local technical schools and really uh, give them hard problems for the, the kids to resolve. So again, just to create the awareness and work with them very, very closely. Um, and one of the other, um, remember when I mentioned that we very uh, well defined what the charity giving we give? It's all around education. We only focus on two. One is education, one is workforce development because who we are. So uh, ongoing continued education is another one. Um, the challenge right now, is, as I mentioned earlier, for us is because we are in Chelmsford, a lot of the uh, new grads don't want to have owned a car. They do not want to uh, travel to the suburb. So it became, becomes very, very challenging. So recently, we actually had to open an office in Waltham just to attract some of these um, younger new grads. Um, initially, to start with, before they saw the family, before they invest in a car, before they invest in, in a car. But uh, that's what we are doing so far. Yeah, obviously. I have heavily invested in Northeastern. We, you know, in, in the next, in the past three years, I've been at HubSpot. It all started with one connection, one student. We went to two, we went to seven. And we have about um, 38 co-ops this year, right? And so it's um, it's just snowballed. And when I first joined, when I first when when first to, uh, to Northeastern, into it, right, was like the internship to get, and, and now everyone 
plus a couple times. So <laughs> I, that's one of them. But I think my other is there's two other approaches to that. One is um, I, I travel with San Francisco to to stay uh, very well connected to the startups over there and build a technology or company that people uh, want to work on that is challenging uh, that they don't need to go over there to find. Right? And so it starts with my company. But then I also am interested in the startup space here in Boston, right? It really boils down to, to money, to VCs. We need more startups here. And they don't take as much risk, uh, the VCs here, as they do in the West Coast. And so, um, you know, I'm starting to get involved with uh, angel investment, you know, Boston Syndicates, is a, some firms here that want to uh, support students here. I work, there's a Rough Draft Ventures, Dorm Room Ventures that aren't giving money to students to do startups while they're in school. Uh, and so it's really about that. We need, we need the capital to, for them to know that it's OK to stay here. I see company after company leaving because they can get funding in the West Coast and they can't do it. That's how we'll have a thriving ecosystem. And then people won't have to leave. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, we, have an, we hired about 25 interns this year. We make that commitment early. We're, like right now, we'll talk to them for next year um, if we think that they have talent. So I don't think that the timing is really that much of a problem. I actually just think it's a demand issue. So, I mean, we got the gold rush going on in the West Coast again, and uh, it's just hard to kind of, you know, be 20 or 21 